Welcome to Biblical Foundations, a podcast of the Center for Biblical Studies at Midwestern Baptist Theological Seminary. I'm your co-host, Jimmy Rowe, along with Dr. Andreas Kostenberger. Join us as we discuss issues in biblical scholarship for the church. Thank you for joining us today at Biblical Foundations. I'm here with Dr. Andreas Kostenberger. Dr. Kostenberger, in 2001, you published your book, Salvation to the Ends of the Earth, A Biblical Theology of Mission, in the New Studies in Biblical Theology NSBT series edited by D.A. Carson. Almost 20 years later now, you've returned to this subject and prepared a second edition of this work with T.D. Alexander, who wrote the chapter on mission in the Old Testament. What was the impetus for this second edition? Well, Jimmy, yes, there were several reasons. Uh, One was that the book has been well-received, especially among missions leaders around the world. Uh, It's very gratifying. And so we wanted to provide a current treatment of the biblical theology of mission. And even though the uh, the biblical theology of mission doesn't change, uh, a lot has happened uh, since the first edition of the book. Uh, for example, uh, Eckhart Schnabel uh, wrote his uh, massive and magisterial uh, two-volume work, Early Christian Mission, which was published uh, initially in 2004. Uh, Christopher Wright wrote his uh, now, I'd almost say famous, uh, work, The Mission of God, talking about missions, uh, part of unlocking the the, the Grand Narrative of Scripture. Uh, it's published in 2006, um, and maybe a lesser-known work, but still very important, John Dixon's uh, Mission Commitment in Ancient Judaism and in the Pauline Communities. And, of course, uh, there are numerous works on the New Perspective on Paul, which in many uh, ways also have important implications for one's understanding of the early church's mission. Uh, N.T. Wright uh, wrote a very important article on Paul's missionary strategy in a book on the last uh, final years of Paul. So I'm very grateful for the the vision and the support of the publisher, uh, University Press in the UK, and and also uh, Don Carson, the series editor, in in allowing me to prepare this uh, second updated edition. Now, in your second edition, uh, you haven't merely updated the footnotes or some of the scholarly interaction that you referenced uh, is often done with the second edition. You significantly recast the entire work and changed the presentation in several ways. Can you tell us about some of the changes and the reasons for them? You're absolutely right, Jimmy. Uh, As I read through the first edition close to 20 years after the original publication, uh, it became clear to me that uh, my thinking has developed in uh, several ways over the past uh, couple decades. Uh, as a result, I've uh, moved from a, uh, you might say, literary canonical approach to a more thoroughly grounded historical presentation, uh, drawing especially on the work of, uh, of scholars like Eckhart Schnabel. Uh, who has a uh, just incredibly robust uh, historical approach uh, in the two-volume work I mentioned, Early Christian Mission. Also, I've uh, chosen to connect each of the general epistles uh, to a gospel witness, uh, such as First and Second Peter with Mark. I've uh, consolidated the chapters on Luke, Acts, and Paul into a single chapter because Paul's mission is part of the larger mission of the early church. Uh, narrated in Acts. And uh, finally, I've moved the chapter on mission in the Second Temple period, as important as it is, to an appendix because I wanted to stay focused on the biblical theology of mission throughout the uh, the body of the volume. That's fascinating. Um, if we could look at some of those changes a bit in more detail. Uh, first, let's talk about the general su- structure of the second edition. Essentially, you have five chapters, one on mission in the Old Testament, then one each on Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, where you group the other NT writings with one of the four Gospels. Can you explain your rationale for those structural changes? So uh, when writing the first edition, my collaborator and I simply divvied up the, the chapters based on previous work on the subject. He wrote chapters in the Old Testament, uh, Luke, Acts, and Paul. While I covered the rest of the material, that is uh, Matthew, uh, Mark, John, 
the general epistles and Revelation, as well as the Second Temple period. Now, in the second edition, I wrote the material on the entire New Testament. It was a massive task, as you can imagine, uh, but it did have the advantage of being of of me, me being able to take a more uh, thoroughgoing historical and meta narrative approach, which I think make the pre- made the presentation much more coherent and cohesive. I think you can see here the influence of of Chris Wright's uh, "The Mission of God." As I mentioned, unlocking the Bible's grand narrative, especially with regard to mission and also N.T. Wright's work, five volumes series, Origins and the Question of God, the, the New Testament and the People of God, published in 1991. So uh, similarly, uh, Desi Alexander and I uh, chose to present the Bible's mission theology from the vantage point of Israel's story, the story of Jesus, and the story of the early church. In the first edition, the New Testament portion started with Mark, based on the tentative assumption of Mark and priority, and then moved on to Matthew, Luke, Acts, Paul, and then John, and finally the general epistles in Revelation. But in the second edition, I chose to follow the canonical order of the Gospels and then assigned the rest of the New Testament material to what seemed to be the appropriate Gospel. Uh, James and Hebrews uh, with Matthew, uh, First and Second Peter, as well as Jude with Mark, Paul's letters with uh, Luke, Acts, and uh, John's letters, as well as Revelation with with John's Gospel. Uh, So in this way, the fourfold Gospel canon became essentially the center of gravity for the New Testament's mission theology, and the somewhat amorphous uh, general epistles category was related more organically to the respective Gospels. Perhaps we can unpack that a bit more um, for our listeners. How did you decide which gospel the other NT writings should be assigned to? Yes, that's a great question, and it it, it, it took quite a bit of thought. Uh, I even at some point uh, conferred with Eckhart Schnabel, whose uh, you know expertise on on uh, on mission I I have so much respect for uh, on this. And in the end, uh, I decided uh, to begin with uh, that uh, James and Hebrews, like Matthew, are representatives of early Jewish Christianity, uh, so they naturally belong with Matthew. Um, uh, Secondly, Peter uh, was most likely a major source for Mark's gospel. Mark and Peter were integrally connected in ministry, as we see in in 1 Peter 5.13. Uh, so it, it made sense to assign Peter to Mark, and then Second Peter, in turn, uh, draws heavily on Jude. So I grouped Mark, Peter, and Jude together. Uh, third, uh, Luke, of course, was uh, closely related and involved in the Pauline mission. So uh, this made for a natural grouping of Luke Acts together with Paul's letters which made for a rather lengthy chapter, as you can imagine, but, but I think a very coherent one. And finally, in addition to the gospel, uh, John also wrote the letters in Revelation, which made up the fourth and final grouping. Uh, so even though uh, some of the individual chapters ended up being longer, especially the chapter in Luke, Acts, and Paul, I think it, it, it made for a better integration, both literarily and canonically, also, and, and also in keeping with the way in which the mission of the early church unfolded historically. If we look at, um, just thinking about your chapter on Luke, Acts, and Paul, um, as you were mentioning, it would be quite lengthy. How do you proceed in that chapter? Yes, yes. So um, I think one of the, the great benefits uh, of, this, uh, of this change and of integrating uh, Luke, Acts with Paul is it, it, it gave Acts uh, its due as, as the central New Testament book on mission. Uh, it's right at the heart of, of my book, uh, which it deserves to be, just like it's at the heart of the biblical theology of mission. Uh, because it, as I structured the chapter and uh, the role it has in the book as a whole, Acts really becomes the template, the missional meta narrative, if you will. Uh, and then uh, I cover Paul's letters uh, 
in conjunction with the various churches he planted, or in a few cases, didn't plan, such as Romans or Colossians. So what that meant is that I covered Galatians in conjunction with the Jerusalem Council in Acts 15, Philippians in conjunction with Acts 16, the Thessalonian letters in conjunction with Acts 17, Corinthian letters in conjunction with Acts 18, and then Ephesians in conjunction with Acts 19. So there's a very natural flow in the way uh, Paul's writings kind of uh, connected with his establishment of churches in those major uh, urban centers uh, as uh, Acts uh, narrates. And then I discuss Paul's other letters following Acts 28, uh, Colossians, Philemon, uh, Romans, and also Paul's letters to Titus uh, and Timothy. And I think this brought out more clearly the relationship Paul sustained with the various churches he planted and shows better how Paul articulated his theology in conjunction with his missionary and pastoral concerns for the various churches under his care. What would you say is a particularly significant contribution you make in our understanding of a biblical theology of mission in your book? Another great question. Well, uh, one of the portions of the book I'm, I'm most excited about is the treatment of Romans, because I believe I can help my readers understand, as I discovered for myself, Romans more clearly as a missionary book. I think the way I I wrote the portion on Romans within the context of the early Christian mission in the book of Acts, it's easier to see how the theology of Romans can be understood uh, most adequately as as missiologically driven. Think of, of Paul's pastoral concern for Jewish-Gentile unity in the Roman church as part of the, the collection he took up for the the Jerusalem church among the Gentiles, also Paul's own missionary strategy using Rome as a stopping point on his way to Spain, and various other networking and strategic concerns that you see, especially in, in, in Romans chapter uh, 16. I'm also excited about covering all 13 of Paul's letters in conjunction with the way in which they were planted. I think shows Paul more clearly as a missionary and church planner in his care for those churches and shows how, how really all of Paul's letters are essentially missionary letters, including, I might add, his letters to Titus and Timothy, which I believe sheds light even on, on, on the Pauline authorship of the so-called pastoral epistles. Can you briefly elaborate on that last point? Well, yes, uh, there are several examples. For, uh, for example, in Titus 1.5, Titus is told to appoint elders in every city. And what do we see in Acts 14, 23 is Paul and Barnabas appointing elders in every city where they've planted churches. So you see that, that Paul's pattern of, of establishing local church leadership, according to Acts, uh, is reflected very clearly in, in, in Titus. Uh, also, Acts mentions that Paul and his co-workers briefly passed by Crete on their way to Rome uh, in uh, Acts uh, 27. Uh, 28, which provides a point of reference for the later outreach to Crete, spearheaded by Titus. And speaking of Titus, it's, it's interesting that he's not mentioned in Acts, but Paul refers to him in Galatians uh, chapter 2 and several times in 2 Corinthians, which shows that Titus uh, had an integral part in the Pauline mission. He, he'd proven himself in a very difficult, uh, delicate assignment with the church at Corinth, as you can see in the references to him there in, uh, in 2 Corinthians. And he's passed that, that test with flying colors, which prepared him for another difficult assignment on the uh, island of Crete with the, uh, you know, the, the moral culture and, and trying to locate the uh, godly individuals that he could appoint there as, as elders and the mature older women that were supposed to mentor the younger women there in Titus uh, chapter 2. Uh, I think those are just some of the ways in which the letters to Timothy and Titus are, are integrally related to the Pauline mission uh, narrated in Acts. And for, for, for those who are interested, I've, I've recently published an article on this in the Bulletin of Biblical Research, uh, 
which I think I also posted on my website, biblicalfoundations.org. Well, that's fascinating. Congratulations, Dr. Kosper, on the publication of this uh, very significant new edition of Salvation to the Ends of the Earth. I can see how some of the changes you talked about make for a more personal focus and also bring out the history of these interconnected figures in the mission of the early church more clearly. Thank you very much. Thank you for joining us today at Biblical Foundations. For more information, please visit the Center for Biblical Studies at Midwestern at cbs.mbts.edu. For further resources, please also visit biblicalfoundations.org. Please join us again next time at the Biblical Foundations podcast.